know we're at the beginning, but we're ready. Otherwise, we weren't ready. It couldn't be the beginning. It would have to be the, already something wrong. No, it's, it's actually nice, be, nice being here to, to come and talk after after Elliot's genre stuff because it puts me into a very good mood. <laughs> One of them, she's irrepre irrepressibly comic, which is really something I've always loved about her. In fact. I, you, one of the things I used to say, or I don't dare say it without Ellie around, is that I, the reason I was so happy to marry her is she always makes me laugh. <laughs> don't think that's a trivial thing. It's, it's not trivial to be able to laugh. And considering the world we happen to be in at the moment, it, it doesn't have to, the, the laughter seems to be one of the few ways of surviving. I don't, it's not that I want to go into the long list of things that are going on in the world that I don't like, but the situations in, all over the world, it always seems to be in a point of crisis. And if you constantly pay attention to the crisis, you get totally depressed. It doesn't help anybody that you do that either. So even if the if ship is sinking, you may as well be amused while the ship sinks. At least you might like the tunes they play while the Titanic goes under the water. Uh, it, I originally intended when I came, came here to do this, uh, our, last year I was going to come here and the Iceland uh, volcano interfered with my life and uh, prevented me from coming. And it's interesting to be pre prevented by a, a volcano. It seems like overkill, doesn't it? I mean, you know, just my poet coming to participate in the conference and the volcano says you can't come. <laughs> But we have things like that all the time, apparently. I should imagine that the volcanoes, not, if you didn't have a volcano, I guess it would be turned out you might have a tsunami, or you might have an earthquake, or you might just have a rainstorm, or you might have an absence of rain. All of these wonderful contingencies that the world is made up of. And then we come and th theorize ways around it in which we make ourselves feel as if we understood what had happened. In some sense or another, the, the earthquake and the tsunami that have placed Japan in great peril seem sort of so startling. They seem startling in a certain sense that one would have expected the Japanese, who had suffered the direct, direct effects of an atomic bomb, you'd have imagined they had a phobia, you'd imagine they'd have had a phobia to, out of the nuclear energy. And apparently they didn't have a phobia to nuclear energy, they should have had. And we learned that they let terrible things happen in their inspections and, they, and <clears throat> their safeguards against bad situations. Which, but even in the best of all possible worlds, that probably they wouldn't have anticipated it, an earthquake and a tsunami hitting just where their nuclear, major nuclear reactor complex is. You wouldn't expect it, but Maybe you have to expect bad things as being, even if they're improbable. The improbable happens, it's not, there's a difference between the improbable and the impossible. The improbable is never impossible. And the impossible is hard to tell. How do you know something's impossible? It never happened. Well, it never happened, but then it happens. Then it wasn't impossible. It, it reminds me a little bit of what the, the limitations of uh, Wittgenstein's early work, the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus, in which he say, which he he he, he, points, he says in his opening sentence, the very shocking opening sentence, the Weltes alles was der Fall ist, that the world is everything that is the case, and that seemed to leave out a lot. If you if you would think about the tsunami and the uh, tsunami and, and the horrible effects of the, of the tsunami, you say to yourself, well, it wasn't the fact that this could happen. For a long time, it wasn't the fact. It was like a black swan uh, or a white raven. I should like prefer thinking of it as a white raven. If the tsunami couldn't, have, couldn't with any probability have happened, unfortunately it happened. And so it, what wasn't the fact before that a tsunami could destroy, could destroy your nuclear plant, it might not have been a fact at the beginning. It might, it might have been a fact that this wasn't the case. So it's a fact that a tsunami will not destroy your power plant because we have all these safeguards. 
And then it destroys the common, uh, the uh, power plant, and it becomes a fact that it did do it. So what what does Wittgenstein in the age of the uh, early work suppose happens? How can, the, how can it be that the world is everything that is the case if the world turns out to have new things that are the case and, and there are things that become no longer the case? The problem is things are constantly changing from being the case to not being the case, <laughs> but to maybe being the case. And I, and, while I thought about this to some extent, I had wanted, before I had been interrupted by this goddamn volcano with an unpronounceable name, at least unpronounceable to my Icelanders, but I had originally intended to come up here and do a talk relating to the idea of experience, which has been one of my, one, one of my major interests, is why I'm so committed to the notion of experience and why what there is in the notion of experience that distinguishes it, let's say, from a theoretical report. The first thing about the term experience that uh, is interesting to me is that you can't define experience collectively. Like, I mean, in other words, like ex experience is like it refers to a collection of things. <coughs> you can't it's experience experience maybe something like a petroleum. You say petroleum, you don't mean a petroleum, do you? Is, is a petroleum, a, is, is there such a thing as a petroleum? No. Is there such a thing as, as grain? Yes. Is there such a thing as experience? What do you mean when you say experience? What does the damn word mean? Does it mean an experience? John Dewey had a book that he wrote, a very strange book he wrote, very inadequate in certain ways, but it has very brilliant aspects to it. And it's a book called Art as Experience. But is art, an ex is art exper as experience mean the same thing as art, art as an experience? Or does it mean that art is an experience? The word experience floats in this strange place. He really thinks he means art consists essentially of having an experience, generating an experience in some way. And what was an experience that John Dewey was rather curious? He gives an account of, he gives an account of, 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 of a man who, I think it was a man, maybe it was a woman, who, uh, oh, in those days they never wrote with women as the examples of the thing. So let me say, it was a woman who has come to, to Paris, and she has been told about this wonderful restaurant on the right bank which has the most astonishingly tasteful boeuf de bourguignon that had ever been tasted by anybody alive. Now that seems rough for, you know, a hearty, commonplace dish like that, it seems sort of, it should be no problem. Well, she orders the dish, and before she orders the dish, she also orders, a, uh, she, she orders uh, an appetizer of frog's legs. Again, this, the specialty of the house, the little amphibian legs. But the little amphibian legs come to her, and she's waiting for all this. In the meantime, she's ordered, she's ordered uh, an extremely beautiful white wine, you know, and from one of the great, great whole maisons uh, uh, around. And she has this white wine served to her as well, and she starts to eat the frog's leg, and it tastes to her like dried out chicken leg. And she's really feeling very bad about this. But she then waits for her book Bigignon. And the book Bigignon comes in, it's tough and stringy. And she then supported it. She thought she would carry it off maybe with a glass of good Bordeaux. And she had ordered the Bordeaux, and it didn't taste as great as it should have. Now, she's in the midst of a total disaster. And they ask her if she wants a dessert. It seems like a crowning insult after having offended her, <laughs> after having offended her with the entree and the, and the main dish. And now they're offering her consolation. They're saying, how about a dessert? But she thinks she'll try. And she orders an apple and, and a slice of a slab of brie. And the apple comes in, and it is the most beautiful apple you've ever seen. It has this sort of 
aroma, the, the odor of the apple is, is like a romantic effusion. The, and the, 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 the wine that she ordered for that turns out to be much better. But the cheese is the masterpiece. This is a Normandy brie that you have never seen anything like. And she remembers the taste of this. Years later, she's, she's very ill and she's dying. <laughs> and her, her son, who is surviving her, says to her, Mother, you must have had experiences that made your life worth living. She said, no, but I had one. <laughs> and he said, what was that? What was that, Mother? She said, of the apple and the brie. I remember the apple, and I remember the brie, and I remember the debris of the rest of the meal through which I climbed in order to arrive at this final dessert, the memory of which allows me to die in peace. And then she died. <laughs> now, this is an account of an experience. It's kept, you know, it's, it's mobilized. It's mobilized around it. Desire. It's, in fact, it has what I call narrative substance. Now, for John, uh, for John Dewey, apparently his theory of it is that an experience essentially is narrative. That is to say, you remember a thing but by the subjective involvement you have in it in which you desire something and there are elements that either come to your aid in, in, in literally in accomplishing it or defeat your possibilities one way or the other. And so you have a kind of struggle with, with something in order to, in order to have a, an, actual, an actual experience. And the actual experience has got a narrative form and I'm discontent with his account of it, which was a little bit of my, my hyperbolic account of John Dewey's account of an experience, he is uh, not happy with that. He's not satisfied with that as, as his idea of how to, how to represent what an experience is. So he says, imagine a rock, a little rock at the top of a hill. Imagine it as having a point of view. What would its point of view be? The point of view essentially is to achieve a resting place that is the most pleasant resting place it could possibly find so that it could stay there forever. The immortalization of the rock in the pleasure of its position in, in the world. But then comes the rainstorm and the rain floods the area and the rivulets pick up the little rock and dislodge it from its face and it starts to roll down the hill. And then it encounters on the way a variety of obstacles, but it seems to be intent on coming to rest at some place. And the only place it could come to rest would be at the bottom of the hill. So the rock keeps trying to come down, to come down the right way. But there are other rocks in its way, obstacle rocks. They kick it in the shins. You know, they try to hold on to it. They interfere with it. It dodges them. It's a very clever little rock. It pirouettes and it moves away like a ballerina dancing. I guess I'm in by <laughs> it, it leaps, it creates a grand jeté over which it leaps in order, in, order to, in order to get closer. It pirouettes, it comes down, it does it, then it also does little bourree like steps. And this little rock finally comes to a resting place at the bottom of the hill and feels it has achieved final, final victory. <coughs> Now this kind of theory, of, uh, of narrative theory of experience seems to me a little bit too funny. <laughs> and, but the thing, about, the thing about Dewey is he's, he's, he's trying to make it a concrete psychological, uh, a psychological genre, the genre of experience. Now, when you, th when you think of it that way, the question is, is that what, what we mean when we say experience or do we really mean that something that we have actually participated in consists of a series of experiences? In other words, it may have the narrative form that it does, but the issue of the word experience is that it refers to something that's not theory, that's not content, pure concept. It's some kind of understanding, it seems, it seems to represent, for most people who use it, some kind of apprehension of reality. 
that is greater in its significance than an abstract account of it. Uh, so that, in effect, a first-hand experience, which is sometimes the word used for it, what is first-hand? What is a, fir a first-hand experience is an experience that you have directly. And it sometimes seems to suggest that it's never been had by anybody else before because this, this is not generically formed. In other words, it's an experience because it has never been formed before. This seems a little excessive, you know, the idea of experience. But I often ask myself, what do I mean when I say experience? Because I use the word often, often uh, when talking about inadequate critical writing. The critical writing seems to come from people who have had very little experience of the things they're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a great deal of such talk uh, that literally seems as if, particularly in the arts, which usually it sounds as if these people have never really known how an artwork ever got made. One of the things is that people are very quick to tell you what an artwork means. I once taught a whole class to find out how artworks make, how artworks go about meaning something. And we weren't sure by the end whether we really had a clear idea of it. But the point is there are people who are perfectly willing to tell you what an artwork means, though they may never tell you how it, how it gets to mean it, or how it lets you know that that's what I mean. I mean, it's as if an artwork gets interrogated, and you say to the artwork, what do you mean? And the artwork tries to tell you the answer. I mean this. That, that doesn't count, that doesn't sort of square with my experience, to use the word. I mean, if you start to do something, you're, you're attracted to some possibility. I was attracted to the possibility of a poetry of thinking. That is the notion of the human mind taking its shape or shaping things, trying to shape things, as it were, to, to sort of throw light upon them in certain ways, to evoke certain possibilities. Like, if you have an artwork like, let's say, Eleanor's imaginary ballerinas, we know they're imaginary ballerinas. And she, she's trying to decide what herself is and decides herself as a set of series of genres. One genre is a ballerina, another genre is a, uh, uh, another, another genre is a king, another genre is a nurse. And you look at these things and say, well, she's decided she consists of three genres, or three and a half. At one point, you have a black ballerina. Uh, so, uh, well, that's, you know, just a, it's not a full genre yet. You know, it's just an impossible genre at the time it was written, but it's not a full genre. And so you wind up saying to yourself, how did she come to this? She didn't come to it all at once. If she, came to, if she couldn't have come to it all at once, she took one step, and then she took a second step, and then she took another step the way art, artists make artworks or poets make poems. You start with something. You may start with, with, you know, with, you know, with some sort of image of something. She started 100 boots. She sort of imagined she saw 100 boots you know, facing the sea. Why a hundred boots facing, if you're, you know, like a certain kind of critic, you say, well, what the hell does she mean by a hundred boots facing the sea? And then they would come up with a theoretical account of what it means, why, they, why facing the sea is different from having their back to the sea. A hundred, so a hundred boots were not turning away from the sea, they were facing the sea. They were facing the, they were facing the immeasurable and the unmeasured, the chaotic, and the, no, she had a hundred boots facing the sea. <laughs> she said to me one morning, David, what do you think of a hundred boots facing the sea? I said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never seen them before. <laughs> she said, well, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I figured she would do something intelligent with them. So what she did, she lined them up on the beach and they faced the sea. And there, there was the fact that she didn't know what they were going to do either, but it occurred to her. She, once she had 100 boots facing the sea, she wanted more 100 boots pictures because that didn't seem to exhaust the, the, or the, the energy generating character of the work. A work has work sometimes, you know you're on a, on a roll when a work of yours suggests more things to be done. When it, when it, when it is a point of closure 
it's, it's going to do you, it's a work you've got to get out of. And because the closure is a, is a defeat for the artist. So she decided she would have a, a series of such images. And then she started to have the images. She didn't know what those images would necessarily be. She didn't know that it was going to turn into something like a picaresque little novel. There were 100 boots going to the bank. It's a nice idea to have 100 boots go to the bank. You know, what, what do they do, withdraw feet? I mean, <laughs> what, what do you do with 100, what, what do 100 boots have to do with the bank? Well, it costs, that costs money to buy the 100 boots. Were they there to pay, pay back the cost of having been bought? I mean, you know, they were ransomed from the shelves of an Army Navy store and turned into adventure, adventurers and felt liberated. So they felt they were paying Eleanor back for the $100 that she spent buying, I think it was about two bucks a boot or something like that. And so were they going to pay back the, uh, pay back Eleanor by going to the bank and withdrawing funds for her? Uh, so that she could send the information, the news to everybody. Look, 100 boots have been liberated from the shelves. It's a way of thinking about it. It's, it happens in parts. Now, <clears throat> as an artist, I've always had a taste for thinking of things in relation to the, what might be a plausible example to see if that would make sense, if it would, if it would make sense for to consider something like that. And I was being questioned by uh, a, a, a very good poet named Don Wellman of a kind of Olson background. Uh, he asked me why I, was, why I had abandoned uh, collage for uh, a re reinterpretation of narrative. And the question posed that way defeats an answer. And he's a smart guy, but the point of it is, when you ask the question that way, you, don't, you, you can't get an intelligent answer. Because the why suggests too, too, sim too much simplicity in it. What I was suggesting was that the, that the development of American media, probably globally, produced a mass media version of collage that the formation of like image, of images on television is essentially essentially creates anti-narrative structures because what happens is given the, the, uh, the system of financing in which commercials are paid for the people who go to watch watch television don't go to pay admission and, and determine their relationship by paying for admission the their the the images are subsidized or the, the video is subsidized by sponsors who pay money to have their, their, their crap more or less being represented on television, right? And these little films that, that represent, these little, little films that represent toothpaste or condoms or Cadillacs are, are wrapped around and into the middle of the otherwise uh, straightforward entertainment forms. So if you, have a, if you have a narrative form, uh, if you have a story type program, whatever, whatever kind, it will be cut in three places. It will have some company immediately be coming, coming in ahead of it that will not belong to it. And it will have something in the middle of it that will not belong to it. And you have something at the end that will not belong to it. And then within, within, within the things that don't belong to it, are things that have the same generic structure as the thing they're cutting into, but with different material. And then you have things in which the, um, the station people advertise their own character, their own network, and future programs. So there's a collage of that stuff that shows up at, at, before a program begins and in the middle of it and at the end of it. And the, the, you have this whole set of collage-like structures that are created uh, by television's financing system that produces collage, and the collage, which is, was a very rich and extremely promising de development because it was a form of reference without reference, without representation, uh, it was a, sort of like, it was representation by, uh, by associate, associative means. And when you looked at that kind of, in other words, it was essentially produced by what's called the, uh, the principle of economy. That is, a, the meaning of a collage was essentially the associated, the, the connotational aspects of a collage. So a 1912 Picasso, or a 1913 Picasso, probably better, uh, Picasso would be a mixture of 
things that were fragments of things he wanted to refer to as a, and connected, juxtaposed against the fragments of drawings that represented the things. And more radically, Schwitters, who was a much more radical collagist than Picasso, uh, is an assemblage of mixtures of garbage that is things that have deteriorated and fallen apart, poetically called Merzbaum, uh, Merz structures or craft structures. Uh, they were put together uh, and celebrated the, the freewheeling principle, the meaning-making principle of autonomy, which essentially is connotational freedom. And as a fellow is connotational freedom, it's one thing. But when it, came kind of, when, it, when it becomes connotationally appropriate, that's when you begin to worry about whether you're working the right way. As soon as I realize something is, is like the desired form, uh, I begin to get nervous. And I got very, I, if I had to say to him, I was get, I, what would I say to Don Holman? I'm getting nervous. Uh, it's not the answer he wanted to have for me. He wanted to know what I was getting nervous for. So I decided literally to write, to write a piece, to do a piece. I didn't decide to write it at first. I did it as a performance piece, which is an accident. Because again, contingency enters into this thing the way contingency enters into experience. Uh, the uh, KUSC, uh, the Southern California, uh, Los Angeles PBS station, wanted to make a survey of California art, Southern California art, the California artists, and the uh, California poets. They give everybody an hour uh, and they send it around. And I said, why do you want me? I'm not a Californian. They said, you've been living here a long time. And furthermore, the people putting this together said they insist on having you. I said, all right, what the hell? But it was in the summer, and I, I didn't know what to do about it. And I was in the process of get, doing talk pieces that would be commissioned by people, and they didn't have to be, I could do them anyway. But I had to assemble a group of friendly faculty so I could do a talk performance. And I did. The talk performance addressed the Wellman's question in terms of a parable. The parable was this. I took a department, I took my, uh, my 70 year old grandmother to go shopping. She insisted she needed to buy shoes. And I would take her to go shopping for shoes. Uh, and as, once we got to the, to the uh, this was an experience I was related. Once I really, took, I really did this, I took her to the to Sears Roebuck because she, Nola Roebuck was gone. But she, <laughs> She, she remembered Sears and she wouldn't feel alienated. Whereas if I took her to Nordstrom, she would feel what's an, it's an alien country. What kind of world do they have? The markets are run by, Nor Nor by Nordstrom. They sound like Scandinavians. <laughs> she was used to Jewish merchants and Jewish stores. And so she was, was hoping for one like that. And I see, she felt happy that I was taking her to Sears, even though it was not a Jewish store. I took her there, and then the question of finding things in a department store, everything has a kind of theoretical order. It's a theoretical order. That is, you have the lingerie here, you have uh, shoes here, you have this there. Now, there's a theoretical order, but the theoretical order is not based on any inherent underlying logic either. That is to say, why shoes should have, a, shoes should have abutted perfumes, I have no idea. But in a particular system, there was make cosmetics, makeups, Verge um, was on the borderline of the territory called shoe. <laughs> there's no particular reason for that, but of course it's not terrible for that to be the case, but you have to realize it. And like, so you don't know what to expect in the next, in the next system that you come upon. You, you're totally surprised when it turns out to be lawnmowers. <laughs> You know, you went from you, you went from cosmetics to shoes, or you went from shoes to cosmetics, and then you were in the lawnmowers. And then you go from lawnmowers to what? You go from lawnmowers to gymnastic equipment. And then you go from gymnastic equipment to uh, what do we go? Lingerie. We go. And I had to find her shoes. So I thought, well, let's go find her shoes. And uh, we find we go to this place where they have all the shoes, and she wants she wants something that comfortable, really comfortable for hanging around in. 
And she doesn't like the prize because the last time she bought shoes must have been who knows when. Uh, and uh, she doesn't like the way it's the way the prize, but also she doesn't see the kind of shoe she wants. And I learned there's a bargain, there's also another section somewhere else called bargain shoes, which is not a shoe thing, but it's an anything thing, it's a bargain. So a bargain lawnmower might be right next to a bargain pair of shoes. It's the bargain section, right? So you have an order that essentially begins to become rather troublesome. You don't know what's coming next. In collage, in collage poetry, you delight when you don't know what's coming next. But my mother was not delighted. She was panicked. And, I, and I, telling the story of my mother and the Sears became a kind of exercise in finding the difficulty of the difficulty of taking pleasure in something that bewilders you, which is not the, not the most common problem in poetry, but it, it certainly has that aspect of bewildering, and maybe a useful form of bewildering. In other words, as long as be, bewildering someone is, wor is worth doing, as long as it delays a closure. Collage was worth something when it delayed closure for people who were too used to closure, for people who were struggling against closure. And this made, but when collage became a, uh, literally a form of propriety, and it became a thing, that's the thing we do. We do collage. So I, I wound up basically offering this extraordinarily uh, long, long story parable as the, my answer to the question. And it didn't answer the question in the sense that it said, I have done this because I'm tired of being mildly confused or pretending I'm confused. Because what happens is poets soon got very familiar with that, with the habits of collage, and furthermore got to use it so often that it was, that it was ultimately a banal approach. But is it always banal? Is there a rule for that? In theory, there may be a rule for it, but my test of it is a test of experience. There are works that are collage works that work anyway. I have not found where my work dealing with collage in recent times relevant. But, but there are things collage can't do, which is kind of interesting. It, it can't, because it, it, it can't really engage uh, with uh, the problematics of the form of experience that we call its narrative form. Collage doesn't work as, na as true narrative. And the reason it doesn't is because it's structured on the breaking up of the true narrative or the breaking up of story. Now here's a crux. I have really made an argument for, and I'm making an argument for it again here as I make it again and again because I think I'm right, that what we call narrative conventionally Essentially, is not narrative, but a, a kind of plot-like, plot-like thing, which I call story. And let us suppose that a story is a chain of events and parts of events that, that as it were, that affect a significant transformation. What is an event? An event is something, is some action that moves something from some place to some other place in some way. So what is a narrative? It's not like a sequence of events and parts of events that affect significant transformation. I argue that narrative essentially is the name I'm giving to the, the confrontation of a desiring subject with the threat or promise, or threat and promise, of a significant transformation that he, she, or they try to bring about or try to forestall and it's possible that they're, that, that, that up, that they're doing both at the same time, trying to bring it on and trying to forestall it at the same time because of its ambiguous outcome. That a, that a, that a threat, that a, every transformation is threatening to anybody who faces it. Because it turns out that you're, you're, you're you know, like the, the transformation has turned you from a beggar in the street into a king of a country, you once you're the king of a country, you forget having been a beggar and you wind up having to deal with the king's troubles. And the king's troubles may be revolution, maybe revolution and possible execution. I mean like you know suddenly 